Uh, welcome to Innovation Golf Presents Toolkit Tuesday. Uh, today's session is on capitalizing on government funding to grow your business. And as entrepreneurs, leveraging government funded programs like TRED and others can be a great option for you to become a more profitable and self sustaining business. Today, we're going to learn about different types of government funded programs and which, which ones are right for your business. Um, we're going to look at how to leverage them and how to improve your business's overall performance. So before I introduce our speaker, Bavik from OKR Financial to you today, I would like to let you know that today's session is being recorded. It's being posted on Innovation Guelph's YouTube channel, and we ask that you turn off your mics for the presentation. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box below, um, and Jordan will be monitoring the conversation. She'll pose your questions to Bavik either throughout the presentation when we have a pause or at the end in the Q&A uh, discussion portion of, of today's meeting. So quickly, before I hand the screen over to Bavik, I'd just like to briefly introduce Innovation Guelph to you. And while many of you on the call today are clients, uh, mentors, partners, supporters, there are quite a few of you who may not have heard um, about Innovation Guelph or know too much about us. So just quickly, Innovation Guelph is one of 17 regional innovation centers. We're located in Guelph. We do actually serve the entire region of Southern Ontario. And while most of our clients are relatively close by, we have one national program. So we actually have clients all the way from Nova Scotia to like all throughout Ontario, all the way to BC. So we're very proud of the work that we do with our clients, helping them grow and scale. And, um, you know, we work with companies from multiple different stages of growth um, from startup all the way straight through to scaling. Uh, we've won some awards. We do some really great workshops like this uh, and we invite you to uh, take a look at their website and find out more but uh, I don't think you're here to talk to me today. Um, you want to hear um, more from Bavik so we're going to move forward but if you do have questions feel free to uh, to reach out to Jordan or I. So a little bit about um, Bavik. Um, Bavik is a VP of Business Development and Marketing for OKR Financial. He brings over 20 years experience in business development and marketing to his role at OKR Financial. He's the former managing director of Canada's largest consulting firm in the government funding and cost optimization. So I'm going to pass things over to Bavik. Thank you. And, and I will share my screen. Okay, can you guys all see that? Yes, we can see that. Perfect. Perfect. All right. And you guys can see the full presentation, not the display, right? Perfect. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, I am going to be running this presentation and workshop today, but the main point of contact after this event will probably be my colleague, Jerome Joseph. He's the main point of contact for Innovation Wealth on behalf of OKR. And the main reason for that is he's actually based out there. I'm actually in Vancouver. So based on the time zone difference, he'd be a better contact than me. Um, but uh, I'm running the, running the event because uh, uh, I'm the expert apparently in the company. So, so what we're going to cover today is a little bit about OKR and what we offer and how that sort of ties into this Canadian tech ecosystem. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit about Canadian tax credits, primary shred, a little bit of a, an overview on how to maximize on that. The government grants landscape, um, asset-based lending, has, how that's leveraged by startups. Um, with OKR and then our process and sort of what makes us different and, and why we're a good strategic partner for young companies. So quick history on OKR. It was founded in 2015 by um, two very well-known uh, angel investors in Canada and uh, they've actually got an international presence now and that's their wheelhouse. That's what they like doing is investing in young companies and helping them grow. Um, we have eight funds across the board and these eight funds are for different types of investors that come into our into our group. So they're more like vehicles for different investors. So depending on what type of investor they are, depends on what type of return they get. So we've got angel investors, friends and families that have come into our fund to family offices and high net worth individuals. And then we also have retail investors which come through a broker. So across these eight funds, we specialize in doing three types of services for the startup, startup world. The first one is we specialize in bridge financing, tax credit and government grants, which is what we're going to dive into a little bit more in detail in a bit here. 
The second one is we provide asset-based uh, lending solutions. A lot of it's traditional, but there are some niche areas where young companies can leverage, which they may not have thought of uh, to grow their business. And our third one is our last fund that we launched last summer, which is our venture fund, where we're actually making equity investments into companies and we're actually assisting with turnarounds. So these are the three main verticals of what we do. When I joined the firm about two years ago, we were at about $23 million of assets under management. Fast track two years, which have gone really, really quick. Uh, we went from seven people to got currently about 24 employees. We now have over $120 million of assets under management and an additional 150 million to deploy into the tax, well, not tax, but into the government funding leverage system for the Canadian tech companies. So we want to give or utilize 150 million this year in this space. So many of, you, many of these companies today on the call that are listening or mentors, we may be able to assist your companies with some sort of funding solution. So why do we care? You know, well, first is what we're solving. So we're actually trying to educate companies to say, maximize on non-dilutive as long as you can without giving away equity too early. We find a lot of companies, especially young ones in the tech space are too quick to raise capital and give away control too early. And, and when they really need to raise money, they've already like uh, only 40%, 30% ownership because they were raising money too early and keep diluting their investment. So our focus is to focus on non-dilutive. And then we care because apart from the two founders are entrepreneurs and angels known, the management team are also entrepreneurs. So we've all been involved in startups, scale-ups, uh, failures, uh, learn and exit successfully. And when we were raising money, when we started, um, especially Jason and Randy, the two founders, uh, they found that it was hard to get shred financing back in the day as, as leveraging uh, to get cash flow through the door without giving away equity. We've evolved from that. We're now doing all types of tax credits and, and government grants. So what makes me an expert? So in the introduction, it sort of says, yeah, I've been doing this for over 20 years in business development marketing. I ran the largest uh, consulting firm that helped in shredding government grants. I've assisted companies personally with over raising over 30 million in government funding. Um, so that's what sort of makes me an expert in that space. Um, and I've worked for some of the largest corporations uh, internationally. So <laughs> based on that information, they call me an expert uh, on, on navigating to talk about this today so the shred tax credit program which some of you may be familiar with some of you may have heard of or not really explored over thirty thousand companies sort of apply for this program every year it's uh it's one of the longest running programs uh, in canada and uh, since 1986 over four billion dollars and maybe a little bit less this year due to a lot of the the covid programs that have come out uh, are given back to companies in canada every year there's over 10 billion dollars of of funding available every year through different government funded programs out there. And we're going to navigate how companies can sort of leverage that or maximize on how to get funding through that as well. So Canadian tax credits, there are three major tax credits, probably in the startup space or young company space that they, they can utilize. The first one is uh, the film tax credit. So anyone that's involved in production, there's some provincial uh, initiatives and federal initiatives for producing documentaries, movies, you know, out here. Second one is digital media tax credits. Any company that's spending a lot of money or a heavy spend on UI work or front end work um, can utilize this program. It's a very lucrative tax credit, it's a provincial program. So depending on where you're based, um, Ontario has version of the program. So does um, BC and Alberta. And then, then you have the Shred. Shred's the most common program, and that's the one I'm probably going to focus on because that's probably the most relevant to uh, a lot of the startup companies that are out there. So when we talk about Shred, I mentioned it's one of the oldest programs out there, and it's probably the most, one of the most lucrative programs um, in the world. It's probably the third one based on R&D spend. It applies to all Canadian entities, whether you're foreign-owned or domestically-owned um, entity, you can apply for the Shred program. Industry is not relevant. Um, doesn't matter if you're in agriculture to uh, aerospace or defense or developing games. Uh, this, if, if you're doing the right work and you tick the boxes, uh, you can claim this. Uh, and when we talk about SHRED, and those who don't know the acronym, it stands for Scientific Research and Experimental Development. The scientific research portion, um, there's probably only 5% of companies in Canada actually apply to that. And they're wearing lab coats and they're actually doing scientific experiments. 95% of the companies are applying to this program and doing some sort of experimental development. And this is where 
some companies sometimes think, oh, well, you know, I understand. I've got to be spending money on salaries and it's all sweat equity. I can't tap into shred. Well, there's actually a way you can. And I'm going to sort of show you guys how that works today as well and touch on that. So as I mentioned, all the industries apply. It doesn't matter whether it's a health, life and sciences or logistics. And if you're doing some sort of R&D, um, there's a high chance you can qualify for this program. So first one is to maybe identify what is a shred project. Right. So simple internal due diligence, right? If you're developing a new product or improving an existing product or a new process or improving an existing process, that's the first step. So when you say a new product, it doesn't mean it has to be something that no one's ever heard of, right? Like, can you reinvent the wheel? Well, if you're improving the wheel, yes, you can, right? If you're developing a new WhatsApp messenger app, yes, you can. And it comes with your due diligence. If, um, if the solution or the revolutionary idea that you come up with is it doesn't exist and you can't find the solution on the internet or the formula or the method or the engineering, you know, you have a high chance that's probably a shred project because you don't know if it's going to work. We have an idea that it may work. You've spoken to a supplier to say, hey, we don't have the, a workaround for this um, currently right now. There's a high chance. And, and then again, it doesn't exist in any handbook, right? So if you do due diligence and, and you think, okay, this is something different. Um, I'm going to try and recreate this with my version with some added features or benefits. It's worth doing that. That's typically focused more on the new product and new existing product that you do. On processes, which is a little bit more different, it's more focused probably on agriculture and manufacturing companies where they might be doing efficiency processes, you know, making things work faster, produce more at a shorter turn rate or uh, improving, uh, uh, saving money through through machine development or modifying equipment that you bought out the box, uh, came from somewhere in Europe, but it doesn't exactly do what you need it to do. So you have to modify it that could potentially be a shred project as well. So this would be a good basis to understand, okay, have we been doing things um, in this area? And if we have, there's a high chance that you can probably apply for shred. The most simple way to understand shred, I like to think of is, um, think of a high school experiment. You have an idea, you develop a hypothesis and you go through the methods. The CRA is not looking, or the government's not looking for you to say, hey, yeah, we've got the brand new thing. What they wanna know is, if you've advanced knowledge, say this works, this doesn't work. So if you go through the procedure and it fails, and it fails again, and it fails again, I'm typically say three kicks at the can, and it doesn't have to be successful, you've got a shred project. And heavily look into that. And it's the simplest way to think about it. We've had obstacles, we've had uncertainties, and it's not working, that is shred. Doesn't matter what industry you're in. And a lot of companies sometimes think, well, we're not engineers, but we've spent money. You've spent money on contractors. There's been failures. Management's been involved in um, figuring this out. There's shred money to be claimed. Uh, and again, if you saw sweat equity right now, I will show you how um, or explain to you a way that you could still tap into, into this program. Now, if the project goes all as planned from A to Z, there's no shred money there. You knew what you were doing. Um, the hardest group of people that sometimes have it difficult in claiming shred are probably engineers when they're doing large construction projects or buildings a large prototype and the reason being is you figure out all the kinks before you build the prototype if you were building bridges you're not going to build a bridge wait for it to collapse to realize where you went wrong you're going to figure it out before you build it and if you're going through that process of understanding okay this material is not going to work or this structure is not going to work and you re rejig it that's all shreddable work so, so just think about high school experiment. That's the easiest way to determine, you know, do you have something there to go after? And then what's eligible in expenditures? So salaries, T4 salaries, and we're not talking about contractors, actual companies that are on, pay, on payroll, those people can be claimed as salaries. Subcontractors would have to be Canadian subcontractors that you can claim. It can't be anyone outside of Canada. So if you've been doing developers in India, China, Ukraine, you'd not be able to claim that as part of your shred. And then if you're developing some sort of a prototype or a widget, materials. You can claim materials that are not resold uh, and that's where you can get back, you get percentage of that cost back in. And then you have a proxy. So the proxy is literally, it's about 55% for overhead such as heating, electricity, lighting, added to your claim. So that's how you sort of build your claim and what you're claiming. 
before 2015, you could claim equipment that would be utilized for R&D work, but that's no longer available. And that's more utilized with government grants now. If you needed to buy equipment to do R&D, they would cover a percentage of those costs. Avik, we have some questions in the chat for you. Fire away. Um, first question, does SRED allow stacking and mixing with other grants? Yes and no. So yes, you can. So you can stack with grants in the sense that how shred works it's all about money hmm. spent i'm having trouble Oops. it's all about money spent and then you get a portion of that back how government grants work it's all about future spend and forecasted spend so let's just say you got approved for anything to do with r d that would be let's say irap for example that would cover 80 percent of the salaries up to a certain point depending on how much money you get anything that's not covered by the program you can then claim on shred so there's a way of maximizing on R&D grants and the tax credit if managed correctly. So the biggest tip I can give you on maximizing this is when you do a shred claim, the name of the project should be based on the uncertainty, the objective, because you might have 10 projects on the go, but they might have a similar theme. So let's say if, I'll take IT, for example, if you were developing IT and some, some sort of software, and you've got eight projects on the go, a common theme across all eight projects might be security issues or latency issues. So you would call the project name based on that. When you're doing a government grant, first tip is to change project name. Yeah, call it the actual overall project name. It could be anything you like, but don't call it the subject. That way it will differentiate the two things. Also on the government grants, when you're claiming the work that you're going to do, try and claim all your routine work. So the routine R&D, so that's covered by the grant. Then anything that's more innovative and more experimental, you then claim on shred. If you do this correctly and you do your reporting right, you can actually cover your R&D expenses by to 100% or more if done properly. So you are allowed to do that. On the stack inside of government grants, and I was going to get to this when I get to the grants, but I'll cover it now, is the government rule is you can utilize as many grants as you like to mix and match for a certain project, but you can only go up to 70% of whatever the project cost is. To date, uh, in the last eight years or nine years I've been involved in this industry, I've never seen one company get to that 70% mark um, because they have other projects on the go with projects are split up. So for an overall project, no one's ever hit the 70%. So you can utilize both shred and government grants as stack to cover funding, cover 100% of your R&D project. Uh, you just got to be smart in the way you report it and, and cover it. Awesome, thanks. And Any other questions? Yeah, we do have a couple more if we could get uh, through them just to kind of top ourselves up here. So um, do mobile apps fall under shred? Is our next question. Again, yeah, if you're developing, yeah. So if you come to uncertainties and roadblocks, yeah. Uh, the big one that a lot of uh, people sometimes don't realize is open sources. So if you're utilizing open sources, which a lot of IT companies do to develop and you're modifying that open source, there's going to be a shreddable project there because it's not always going to be straightforward. So as soon as you hit a roadblock, there's a high chance you got shred, especially in IT. Um, there's a lot of R&D available or oh, shred. You can claim on that. The other one is APIs. If you're developing APIs and integrations, high chance you've got a shreddable project because, again, it never goes to plan. Every time you build an API and you integrate, it's going to break something. Uh, the most common thing that it breaks when you're integrating is uh, accounting systems. Um, QuickBooks and Simply Accounting, all of them great planes, they always break or something goes on when you do develop APIs. But developing apps, long as it's not a long as there's a back end and you have issues, let's use scale up and security, there's always going to be shred there. Okay, cool. And um, does this apply to service or uh, teaching companies? Depends what you do. So again, in the services and the teaching, so you've got to be you got to work with a smart consultant, let's put it that way, for that to work. And so long as when you're doing services or in the teaching industry, if you're going through a process where you don't know what the result's going to be until you've gone through it, and that doesn't mean if you're teaching someone then they, they pass their subject, but if there's a method to it and you're doing something that's unheard of, definitely. It's just going to be just like, is there a scientific look at it? Is there a way to say, okay, this is an experiment that we're going to go through and there's a cost applied to it. And if I spend... $50,000 on trying to experiment on this process for teaching and it fails, you've got a high chance of making a claim. So long as you can justify the spend and the risks, yes. But have I heard of it on teaching, not on the service side, but on the 
app development side, there are many, many companies at the moment creating platforms for interactive teaching that are claiming shred right now. Awesome. Um, this one was just a follow up to the stacking question. So it would also depend on other R&D grants. So should they check with them as well? Yep, all R&D grants would apply into the, uh, against this. So not just IRAP, I just used IRAP as an example. So whether you've got one from Agri Innovation or uh, SDTC and it's covering R&D costs, yep, they all apply anything to do with R&D. And then the tax credit, you can't double dip. So you've just got to be really smart on how you apply the funding. Awesome. I have, um, there's a lot of questions that have come up in the chat. So if you are planning on touching on any of them later in the presentation, just let me know and I can make sure we circle back. Okay. Um, but uh, I can go through them now. Um, um, what advice do you have for companies that would qualify for large amounts of credit and grants bes uh, besides start with one? Um, sorry, me. What, what, what do you mean by large? What, advi what advice are they looking for? As in how to go after them or? I'll ask uh, Andrew to clarify that for us because I'm not sure. Um, so while he's typing in a response, um, I will ask the next one. So are you going to talk about social enterprise grants? I'm gonna cover a whole, uh, a broad range on grants and how to navigate them, but particular, actual particular grants, no. Okay, do you have information um, about social enterprise grants and where we could find that? I do, um, and I'll see if I can cover it, but we do have limited time today, so I yeah, no can't drill down on specific grants. Okay. Um, can you combine SHRED uh, with SUES, so C-E-W-S? Can you combine SHRED? So you've got to, you've, it's, you can't combine tax credits. It's more about what applies where. So the tax credit will only apply for certain spend. Those grants will then apply to certain spend only or the reimbursement. So for example, anything to do with the COVID, um, yes, you can combine it, uh, but what happens with those benefits is it, it will cut your claim. So if you've received any sort of benefit or relief for salaries, for example, and they're doing R&D work, then the amount that you can claim is the only difference that you haven't got covered by that program. So it's not really stacking, it's more, you got to figure out, and this is a lot of companies made an error here, is they all went after this money and now they realize they could have got more back if they just did shred. So it's just about balancing it uh, or pre pre understanding of, um, okay, what's going to be a bigger benefit to me as a company? And some, it really doesn't matter. It just works out. And some it's, it's, made, a, it's made a dent in the type of shred or return they can get. Um, and does shred apply to HR services? Again, it depends, what are you doing? Where's the risk? It's all about risk and uncertainty on the project. Okay, and our last one here um, for now is what smart consultant would you recommend? I will get to that. Awesome, so I will say to everybody going forward, if uh, there's not a specific grant topic that is covered, we can connect you with OKR and our consultant room uh, after the session. Perfect, so, um, so going to just touch up on the last couple of slides on the shred. So who can apply, right? So the first one is um, a CCPC, which most of the companies are where you're small and medium and your ownership is more than 51% by a Canadian or a, a permanent resident. So what do you get back? So why is this program important? The first one is I mentioned what you can claim. So if you're a small CCPC and your net taxable net income is less than 800,000, you can get salaries, contracts, and materials back. You'd get about approximately 65% of your salary costs back. That's why it's really important. That's T4 employees. That's where your biggest bang of the buck is. 32% of contractors, 42% of materials when you're developing prototype and you can't resell. The refund comes back as cash. That's why it's really important. So you're actually getting a physical check back from the CRA. As long as you don't know taxes, they don't cut it off. The full amount comes back in cash. So this helps companies you know, reinvest. And if it's a short-term project, and the owners have enough money, you can go to Vegas with the money and just blow it. They don't really care because you've already spent the money to return based on that. So it's really important for young companies, the quicker they can get on this program to utilize it, because sometimes what happens is for the first three years, you're doing sweat equity and you don't pay yourselves. And then all of a sudden you're commercializing, really R&D gets reduced and there's nothing to claim. So your heavy claims going to be in the early years as you're developing the product. So the quicker you can get on this program, the better it is and the more beneficial it is now if you're a foreign owned company or a large CSP, you can still claim shred it's about 50 percent of what i've 
shown in the previous slide that you get back, but it get actually gets applied to your tax credit as a corporate tax. Um, I don't think there's going to be that many companies on that court in this meeting today, but there may be a few foreign owned companies that come here. So sometimes you might want to think about either getting the residency or getting a partner to make sure it's more of a CCPC versus a non-CCPC, and you can leverage the program. There are companies all over the world, and especially in, in the States and in Europe, that are setting up um, R&D specific entities just in Canada just to utilize this program because it offsets so many costs, especially on the salaries. So that's why this program exists. It's not going anywhere. Um, Canada is currently about 47th in the world, in the world of tech, and there's a big mandate to get us pushed up into towards the top 15. So this program is not going anywhere soon. So it's definitely there. So a couple of ways to simply maximize on your shred. So the first one is, I'll just use a quick case study for BC. It's really similar to Ontario. Um, what you'd get back. So if your salaries and subcontracts is a Canadian, total expenses are 200, you get a federal portion and you get a provincial portion back. You're looking at a $97,000 return approximately. Based on this, yep, that's a straightforward, easy shred claim. Yeah. How do you maximize on doing a few little tweaks there? It's really easy. If the subcontracts that you're using are Canadian uh, and they're willing to come onto payroll, all of a sudden it changes your claim. So sometimes you're like, you might have subcontracts only for a three month period or a four month period. Even if they're short term contractors, have a conversation with, say, do you mind going on payroll? You'll find a lot of them will say, yeah, don't mind. You're still going to pay taxes at the end of the day. And this will help you increase your claim, especially if they're just involved in R&D. Um, it's worth having. It. So this is simple, a simple tip that if you can get short-term subcontractors on payroll, you can increase your claim. And you can see the difference is almost like, you know, $30,000 uh, by just doing the quick switch. So it's cash for your owners and founders to get back. So it's definitely worth looking into this uh, when, when you're making a claim. The most important thing is when you guys start doing shred claims, you're going through this is documenting everything. And now it's not required to actually submit the claim, but if you get flagged for an audit and as a first time claimant, you have a very high chance of getting flagged for an FTCAS. An FTCAS is a first time claimant audit review where they would actually come out to educate you on the shred claim. It's actually a good thing to, to get flagged. And I always advise many companies to be aggressive on the first year claim because you want to get flagged for this FTCAS. If you get flagged for the FTCAS, you have a 99% chance that you're going to get everything you, um, you claimed. And they use that as an education to teach you what the rights and wrongs of your claim and how you should be navigating shred. So it's really good to that. And if you've used a consulting firm, you know, they just come and advise you. It's just a walkthrough process. But when they do do the audit, they do want to see, have you kept timesheets? Can you prove the work that was done and who did that and the cost associated with that? So the earlier you start keeping track of this, the better it is. A simple tip for this is if you're a young company and you've got limited spend, you don't need to buy fancy software to do this tracking. You can simply just create an email address, say shred at your company domain name. And then anything to do with that project, if you're emailing each other, engineers, carbon copy that email address. If you're developing prototypes, take pictures, throw it into that email address. Whiteboard meetings, throw it into that. And remember, when you're claiming, it's not just the people that are doing the work. If management's involved in any troubleshooting uh, and taking time out of that, or if you dare doing that, it could be 10%, it could be 25% of your time. That is also claimable under shred, even though you haven't done physical work. So documenting this is really good. And the other thing is if you're working with a consultant or you're doing this internally, you now have a timeline to do the shred. So you can go back 18 months from your fiscal year end if you haven't claimed shred yet uh, to claim shred. But if you are doing that, uh, as you go through the exercise, the first time is a little more work. It's easier and easier year after year. You may have to go back and find these timesheets or create timesheets or pull this together, brainstorming about all the failures that happen because that's where the money is, right? The CRA is actually giving you money to fail. So if you haven't done it, go back 18 months and figure out where, where all the failures were and put it together and talk to engineers. Uh, and then this is what you need to do. So documentation is really key if you get audited. And I can tell you now, first-hand experience that when you do get audited like for a proper audit, whether it's year three, year four, for any reason, to put the documentation together file for that is 10 times more work than doing a shred file. So the earlier you have it prepared, the better it is for what you guys are doing. Um, any questions on this, Jordan?
We have two questions in the chat. Um, so the first is, it was back on, um, it was a couple slides ago, but if you take an owner's draw rather than a salary, does that still qualify? No, it doesn't. You have to take a T4 salary. So there's two ways of doing this. One is yet yeah, you can have your shared dividend. And if you've really been doing the work in R&D, um, give yourself a bonus salary, decide whatever number you want, uh, and then you can claim that because that'd be a T4 salary. So shared dividends uh, are not claimable. Shareholder loans are not claimable. It has to be a T4 salary. And as an owner, you can decide how much you want to claim. Okay. Um, next question, which I believe you answered, but how far back in time can you claim a shred credit? I think you said 18 months. 18 months from your fiscal year end. Yeah. Awesome. And can a general partnership qualify for shred or only corporations? Uh, yep, a general partnership can claim as well. As long as you've got salaries or contracts of cost, you can definitely claim shred. Awesome. And that's it for now. Perfect. So simple process, whether you're doing internally or you're working with a consulting firm, it's like a, it's a five-step process. You've got some firms out there, and I'll mention them, that can turn around a shred claim in three days now. Um, and they've got methods to do that. But, you know, Really what the first thing is, identify the projects that you want to claim. Uh, you Sometimes firms have about 30 different projects. So the idea is to try and theme them so you have less and less. And the reason being is you only have so much space when you're running a shred claim. It's like 1,500 words for one section. And if you've got a lot of projects, it's how do you fit them all in there. So once you've got the project identification, which is really high level, you, you do sort of technical interviews where it's a bit more nitty gritty with whoever's really involved, head engineers or the head developers, or to go understand, okay, where were the real challenges on this project? Typically that could take anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes to complete a technical interview. Then it's the financial data, accountant, bookkeeper, whoever keeps the numbers, uh, just to match with the work or the people that were involved in the project or invoices from contractors. You complete the technical write-up and then you submit to claim through your accountant. It sounds really simple, but there is a little bit more involved in that, especially on the technical right. The most important thing is if it sounds like routine work, you cut, your claim will be cut. So it has to sound, you've got to use the right words. And this is where consultants are really good at it because they do this every day. But however, if you had some experience in Instrad, you can write them up yourself. It's all about bandwidth and what makes better sense for a company cost-wise as well. So if I talk about consulting firms, there's over 200 of them in Canada. Um, and, you know, most of them will charge based on contingency fee, which will range anywhere from 10 to 30%, depending on who you work with. Uh, the 30% sounds extraordinary, but they still exist. There's companies that are still charge in that, uh, and they get paid that. My biggest advice would be when you're using a consulting firm, and this is where we say smart consultant is you want to work with a firm that has a consultant that actually understands your technology. So some firms have engineers, developers, or food scientists as consultants that work for them full-time on payroll. And if they understand your technology, they don't have to Google translate anything. They can just write it up. Um, sometimes you go with an accounting firm and say, yeah, we'll file your shred fee for X amount of dollars, but then they rely on you to write the technical report. And again, if you're not used to writing shred, you might, might not write it correctly enough to maximize on it. What I say about shred is shred's an entitlement. It's your right, if you spent the money on R&D, it's your right to get that money back. So accepting 60% return or 70% return is not acceptable because that's that's not what you should be getting. You should be getting close to 100% on your spend every time if you've done the work uh, and you believe in what you've done. It's innovative. So if you're, if you're saying, well, I'm in this industry, I'm looking for a particular consultant, reach out to Jerome. Um, we work with probably 90 of the 200 firms that are out there. So we know who's best at what, we know who's good at what, and some, some of these firms do both shred and grants. So it depends on a combination of what you need. Um, and some of them are very particular in certain industries and they're really good at that. Uh, and if you're in that space, we'd probably recommend them to say, you know, they'll just understand, they'll just get it versus you banging your head against the wall because they don't understand the technology. So again, most of them work on contingency firms. Some firms do charge hourly if you want them to charge you hourly or a fixed fee. Um, most of them are versatile enough to do that, but the best route for, is probably contingency fee with uh, consulting firms. Any questions on that? I have a question. Um, would you suggest that it's better for the technical people involved to write up the technical write-up rather than a consulting firm since they understand the technology best? Uh, no, I'd still say the consultant's better because as I said, if you get an engineer, they're just going to get it and they're just going to have to present it a lot better. Uh, what you'll find with and no offense to engineers, engineers are really smart people. 
And a lot of the time when you try and do shred with them, everything's in their head. They don't like writing things down. They just know oh, it was easy. Even if I spent 10 hours doing it, it was easy. So pulling that information out, it's a bit of an art and then dressing that up. So it's accepted by the CRA is the best way to do it. Cause you might, I've seen it a lot of times. Engineers will use words that it, it's not routine in their heads, but when it sounds routine where a consultant will sort of dress it up a little bit more where it's accepted by the CRA as innovative work. Um, like even using a keyword in IT, like algorithm sparks innovation, right? But uh, so I'd still suggest consultants are better, but I'm not saying you wouldn't get it right. I just said, you've got, probably got a high risk if you end up using, if you're not used to doing it, you end up using routine words. Awesome, thanks. Um, so how does OKR come into this space? So what we do is we do shred financing. What that means is, so if you had a December year end, uh, most companies typically file their taxes two to three months after the year end. No one ever files their tax on the day their month ends. So if we use December, an example, and you ended up filing your application in February, the average time is about three months to get your return from the CRA. I've done a claim where someone's had their money in three days, uh, two weeks, but average has always been about three, three to four months. So if you need immediate cash, it's all, I need to hire, I need to fast track this project, and you can't wait three months, that's where OKR comes in. We would finance up to 75% of your forecasted return. So if your consultants or internally you figured out, okay, my return is going to be about $300,000, we would give you up to 75% of that upfront. You reinvest straight away. Uh, and then you pay once the money comes back from the COA to pay the loan off. It's pure bridge financing, utilizing shred as the collateral. So when we do the shred uh, security, that's the only thing we take. There's no personal guarantees. There's no, we want ownership of your IP or your equity. It's purely non-dilutive financing to get you going. Now, by the time you come to June and let's say, oh, right, we need more money because we've got other hires we need to do. Well, you've already got six months of accrued R&D spend and we would finance that for you. So it doesn't have to be close to filing or being filed. We can do accrued R&D spend as well. So this helps young companies get sort of cash flow when they need it, if they haven't got any other ways through banks or receivables coming in when they're really young. So this is what we do at OKR is one of the things we do is we leverage shred as a financer. And it's not just for shred, we do the IDMTC tax credit, the film tax credits as well. And IDMTC is really important and the film tax credits is if you're in that industry, those programs return are a little bit longer. Film tax credits can take anywhere from six to 15 months to get back. Uh, IDMTC could take up to 18 months to get your return. So if you need cash now and there's a lot of spend there and there's a, a file being made, you, know, you can leverage that earlier to get cash to the door. Any questions on Shred? Nope. Well, I think we're good for now. Perfect, okay. So government grants, uh, interesting landscape, um, and we're going to cover this now highly. So if you're doing these following things, if you're having a regional impact, uh, improving your competitive advantage, uh, you're hiring, you're training, you're growing, you're exporting, you're being innovative, um, there's a high chance you can probably qualify for some government funding. Now, when we talk about government grants, um, there's over 2,500 programs federally and provincially available for a variety of different industries. 90% of the programs you're going to see are the non-dilutive uh, or the non-refundable programs, 95% of them, but they're also a dollar to dollar match. So you need some sort of cash contribution to qualify. How do you find these programs? Um, there's government websites, there's consulting firms that specialize in this port, there's funding portals, there's events. We can find these programs. The government website is a great resource, but it's also not the greatest because they don't update their sites regular enough. They don't update or change changes to the criteria regular enough. And you'll find a lot of programs there, but it'll say status is closed, 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 closed. Consulting firms sort of stay on the ball and they work around that to make sure, you know, we can maximize, get this going then. And then funding pools are great if you've got the resources and the bandwidth to go and do the applications yourself. There are many programs out there, especially ones that are under under $30,000 that the applications are pretty straightforward to do as long as you've got the time to do that. Uh, and then events. Um, the government has become a bit more proactive in navigating um, the tech in the tech events to promote programs. So a lot of the accelerators now have a MyTax representative trying to promote those programs, to try and get salaries covered. Um, IRAP's making the rounds now a bit more regular, but even though 
as you apply for IRAP, um, they never have money because they normally deploy everything in the first week of April. And it's supposed to last 12 months. Um, but there are ways around that and to navigate that. So there's ways to navigate these programs to maximize them. And the first one is to think about developing a mini business plan. And what this means, it doesn't have to be so detailed, but it's a high level based on, let's say what the spend is going to be over the next three to 18 months. And the reason I say spend is, as I mentioned, 90% of the programs are based on some sort of dollar contribution. If you're not spending money, you're likely not going to get any funding from the government. So you've got to think of the government as an investor. So the difference between tax credits and government grants is the tax credits and entitlement. You spend the money, you're right to get money back. Government grants, and I apologize if there's any, any um, ITAs on the call and the, on the meeting says, but they're like the mafia or the mob, right? It's all about relationship building. And if they don't believe in it and they don't like what you're doing, they're not going to fund you. So that's the number one obstacle. So you really got to engage with a program manager. And then again, because I think a government investor, so they want to make sure you've got money to invest and to, to utilize the program. And I'll get to the end of ways OKR can help you qualify for these programs if you don't have the cash flow in with the service that we do. So the business plan lets you review your plans every three months, every quarter. So, you know, if there's any changes, there may be a new grant for those changes, whether it's a different type of hire, or it's a different type of R&D project or a marketing activity. Depending on the industry, there's a variety of programs. And the biggest thing I would say to execute on receiving funding is if you've had the meeting with the large for the large ones with a program manager or going for a small program is if you know the opening time for a a grant and not all these grants are available all year round some of them only have a one month window is to be prepared it's first come first serve for many of these programs so you should have an application ready two weeks prior to the window opening if you're halfway through the budget and you're applying chances of getting maximum funding are very slim especially if they only have limited funds and they're not available all year round so it's all about pre-planning to execute to get the highest return in government grants um, and you'll find if you can plan for that and think about that you'll get a lot more funding that's out there. Many young companies, they don't think about government grants until it's an afterthought. They're all about going out there, building the product, getting it out there as quick as they can. And these government funding initiatives can actually help them fast track and get there further. So it's really important that you can sort of devise this plan. And then, and again, if whether you do it internally, you go with the consultant route, this is the best way to execute on government grants if you want to you want to utilize them. So when we when we talk about five key areas where most of the funding is over the 2500 programs there's five areas where definitely there's more money available than anything the first one's r d which was touched on earlier which can cut into shred but you can use r d funding to do buy purchase equipment for r d and there's a variety of different programs not just a common one such as irap but if you're in the agri, agri innovation world there's a lot of funding available there manufacturing again you know, if you're specifically just doing manufacturing, there's funding available there. And in Southern Ontario, especially, if you are thinking of setting up a manufacturing plant, there's a program that will give you up to 15% of the project cost funding, you know, to get that going. The banks won't even give you 15% to set up a project like that. So there's some real lucrative programs in R&D, right? Especially in Southern Ontario as well, if you're in the agri, agri space or manufacturing. Um so most R&D grants will cover salaries. That's their most focus as R&D initiatives, but it doesn't have to be totally innovative. It could be routine R&D, but you're just doing R&D and it covers. And you've got federal and provincial funding programs and initiatives in there. Then you've got HR and training. This is probably one of the biggest focuses. Um, why I'd say this is a big focus is no matter what grant you go for, whether it's an R&D grant, a marketing grant, or a green initiative grant, the number one focus the government wants to see is when you're presenting your project to them, that you're going to grow a Canadian company and then you're going to hire Canadians or residents to grow your company. The reason that the government wants to see that it's not just about you building a product as quick as you can and selling it to the highest bidder. It's about growing a Canadian brand. And then if you have Canadian sales, tax dollars are going back in the system. If you have Canadian payroll, tax dollars are going back into the system to generate more programs or keep this running. So hiring and training is a massive initiative. There's a variety of programs. The number one criteria for most programs in Ontario and federally is they've got to be under 30. And they're trying to get the young people, the young workforce into the Canadian system. Um, you can't have uh, anyone that's on a work visa or a student visa qualify for a grant. They have to be a resident, refugee status or Canadian citizenship to qualify for the grant. 
again, when you're planning budgets and uh, depending on what type of hires you want, there's some programs where you can have unlimited interns. Um, so SWWP is one of those programs where you can have as many as you like and you can get up to $7,500 an intern. You know, so you can have 10 of those and, and that allows you to budget. There's some programs that will pay you up to $15,000 or higher. Um, it's going to relaunch again, I think, believe it in, I believe it's in the summer where um, it's for skilled workers and you can get anywhere up to $15,000 per hire. So if that you get a proof for that for the variety of different roles, now that allows you to have a budget for hiring and the type of roles you want to do. So hiring is a big initiative um, for the programs. And then hey, training is another one. So we're training, um, Ontario is one of the lucky provinces where you've got two different types of programs. You've got a federal initiative where you can get up to $10,000 per employee for third-party training just to advance their skills. And then you have a $7,000 grant for internal training. So when you're onboarding and training people. So what, what does this allow companies to do? There's two things here. One is if you can get approved for a hiring grant, it allows you to be a bit more competitive in the landscape of hiring the right people, especially if you're in a niche industry and you're fighting for the talent. So all of a sudden, if you've got a grant approval and you have an average of 60,000 salary, maybe you can offer 67 or 69. Um, if you've got a training initiative, you know, that could be attractive. Hey, if you do onboarding, you know, we'll train you, we'll invest in you. So these initiatives utilize to go and um, hire and be more competitive in the market. And then you've got commercialization programs. So marketing, business development, there's a variety of different programs. Most common one probably is Can Export. They've made their program a little bit easier to navigate and get funding for. Initially, it used to be, for example, you had to be in business two years and have X amount of revenue to qualify. They've sort of eliminated that. And they've also got another stream where if you do any sort of collaboration with another country with R&D and marketing to break into that market, you can cover costs. So marketing grants, depending on the industry, there are a variety of programs covers. There's some programs that cover packaging. There's some that cover uh, domestic trade shows. Uh, there's international trade shows. Uh, right now, because it's COVID, they're not covering flights and travel, but it used to cover those costs as well. If you were setting up shop in, let's say the US and you were getting some legal counsel, it'll cover up to 20% of those fees on some of the programs. So there's a variety of marketing programs out there to, to grow your business. And then you've got capital expenditure. Typically, this is more focused on the agriculture and manufacturing industry. Um, but you've got a lot of programs out there that cover equipment, um, HVAC systems, depending on what you need to do, new technology, improving processes. Uh, there's money out there in this section as well. And then, and then you have green initiatives. So green initiatives is a major mandate this year for all provinces. So there's new programs coming out. Um, anything to do with carbon footprint that you can tap into. And the funding here is anywhere from 50,000 to several million dollars. So it all depends on your project costs and, and what you're doing, but there is a big, big mandate on green initiatives right now. Um, and depending on which province you're in, there are some focused initiatives, but so far Ontario and Atlantic Canada have the biggest um, initiatives in this space to give out funding for. So how do you navigate these programs? I mentioned, you know, there's portals out there. so a really new one that's out there, which is really user-friendly and free, I'd like to plug them, is um, hellopocketed.io. Um, so I check them out if you're looking to sort of navigate this internally. Um, but there are consulting firms. Again, they work on contingency fees uh, between 10 and 20% on helping you get grants. So if they don't get you the funding, you don't get approved, they don't get paid. Um, you can do it fixed fee as well. And it'll vary anywhere from $150 to $300 an hour just to get a grant writer uh, through these firms or individual. Um, now, there are a few programs, I'll probably say just over half a dozen, that doesn't allow contingency fees, but there is a work around those where the consultant will say, okay, let's get the verbal approval. IRAP is a good example. And then you sort of have an approximate what the dollar amount looks like that you're going to get approved for. And then they will give you a fee second to it. For us to do the application, the work will charge you X amount of dollars, which you negotiate. So again, there are a few programs that don't allow this, um, especially on the larger side. Uh, but most of them allow you to do contingency fee based consultant if you go that route. Again, if you do internally, just make sure you have a plan, a mini business plan, and then um, and, and execute on that way using a portal or the government websites to research and see where you qualify. So a lot of you young companies, I mentioned them, um, 90% of the programs are a dollar to dollar match. So how do you get approved on that? So 
being a consultant in the consulting world for about six, seven years, I found that these programs aren't designed for young companies because the government doesn't like them because you don't have money. They think startups going to fail. That's why they have this cash contribution. So I've got a system where I can provide an LOI to provide the matching contribution so you can get qualified for the approval. So now the money is not the issue. It's just about the technical personnel and being liked for the larger programs or the program manager. Once you get approved, what happens with most of these programs is they don't give you the money up front. They give it to you as you spend, and then you submit a report or you hit a milestone, then they reimburse you. So again, the reimbursement can take anywhere from 25 to 90 days. And if you're a young company, cash flow is always an issue. So what we do is we can leverage the, the grant, the approval, uh, as a security, just like we do with Shred, and we will finance that for you. So then you now have capital to go utilize the program. So that's what we do at OKR with the government funding and uh, the tax credits. Any questions? We have a couple of questions in the chat. I will say first that, uh, Bavik, you mentioned Hello Pocketed. Uh, Innovation Guelph has a partnership with Pocketed now um, as a perk partner. So Innovation Guelph clients can email me, Jordan, or Mickey, um, and we can get you on the Pocketed priority access list. There you go. Um, our first question, is there funding available for professional development of existing employees? Yes, so that's what the training grant is. So the training grant is not for new employees, it's for anyone that's an employee. So even owners can use it. It's up to $10,000. I believe in Ontario, it covers up to 56% of the cost of the course and it caps out at 10 grand. So yeah, so existing employees can utilize that program. Um, every province has a different way of running the program. So for example, in Alberta is, if, you're, if the third party training is do your job, it doesn't qualify. It's got to be something outside the scope. Whereas Ontario, it could be for anything. It could be educational. It could be for safety. doesn't matter. Um, in BC, the program only open, you can only apply every quarter. Ontario doesn't have that many. You can apply any time, any time of the year you like. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, what grants are available for digital adaptation? There's a variety of programs out there. So you've got IRAP, you've got the, depending on where you're based, there's a few digital, digital focus grants. Canadian Media Fund um, has programs as well. Canadian Media Fund has about 30 different streams uh, to go apply for. So it really comes out to exactly what you're doing and we can, what you can go for. Again, I've got to reiterate, I'm very well versed on, all, on, on many of the programs, but I'm no, I'm no longer the expert in that sense by reeling off program names because I don't do it every day anymore. Awesome. Um, and then a follow-up to the question about um, the, the training grant. Um, if I'm taking my master's, oh, I got a, something in the way, sorry. If I'm taking my master's and I am the business owner, can I qualify? You can apply some of that funding towards that, yep. Okay, awesome. I think we're caught up for now, unless anyone has any questions. Outstanding. I think we're okay for now. All right. The next slide is going to be read pretty quick now, guys. So those were the more detailed ones. So the next one is asset-based lending. So asset-based lending, traditionally, you know, equipment, inventory, things like that. As I said, if the banks can't help you, then we're normally the last resort and we can help you guys out with that. And where the banks can't really help you, especially on the if you land a big contract, is if you haven't been in business for more than 18 months and you have no revenue. They'll just say, come back when you have revenue. And yeah, feedback there. Uh, so if you're doing that and you, 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 so let's say I've got a client in Ontario just landed a contract with Canadian Tire, for example, and it's a million dollar contract and the banks won't give them any money to meet that contract. We will. We will take the contract or the purchase order security and provide financing so you can go leverage that and go do that project there and, and hit, hit the goals. So that means, again, you don't have to give up personal guarantees or your house or your IP or equity to secure funding. Uh, and, and so for us, we find it's a very niche way of funding young companies because no one else is really doing it. Uh, they're like, you're not thinking of it that, okay, how do we get these companies over the line? And a lot of the young companies are getting paid for pilot testing, you know, especially um, they're like, yeah, we'll, we want your product, uh, but you need to do a pilot test and we'll pay for the testing, but we're not going to give you money up front. There's no deposit, there's nothing. So they really want to do the project, but they just don't have no money for it. And that's where we come in. It's really simple. And there's about six or seven areas that we sort of need sort of a proof of that this exists, like forecast. Sometimes if you've not been in business long enough, you might not have two years of financials. 
But as long as you've got internal statements, we can help you with that. So it's a straightforward process. What I forget to mention on the shred and the grants is the process is really quick and I'll get to how long it takes near the end of this um, the presentation. If you're doing anything that's outside of Canada, so if you're working with clients in the States, Canada, uh, Africa, doesn't matter where it is, I encourage you to look on the EDC site. They have a variety of funding programs as well. And they have an issue, but also get EDC insurance. The reason I'm going to mention EDC insurance, it's going to tie into government grants as well. There are programs. So for example, let's say you were collaborating with a company in Africa. The Business Development Group of Africa has a variety of funding initiatives that vary from 50000 to $5 million. And they love Canadian companies. That program is work, those programs are working with EDC Canada and they're insured by EDC Canada. So if, for example, the grant doesn't come through for some strange reason and they don't pay you because of the nervousness of working with another continent, you're covered by EDC. So it allows you to carry on doing that work. Same thing with the European grants. There's a lot of European grants out there. Um, there used to be Eureka, there's Horizon, there's some other variety of programs. Uh, there's some initiatives with India and China that work through IRAP, all again, covered by the EDC insurance. So I encourage all young companies, especially if you're going to start making um, noise in other countries and want to establish there, are doing some sort of work. There's, uh, there's funding available and look at the EDC side for funding. On top of that, if you've got contracts and actually doing some sales, EDC insurance is very important to have you cover. It'll cover up to 90% of your costs if something goes wrong. So uh, that's on the asset-based lending. Any questions on that? I have a question um, for our previous slide that we got in after. So if a digital adaptation were included in a can export application, does the funding cover the costs of doing the work and not just the consulting? Yep, it does. So if you're if you're if that work you're doing for the digital adaptation is all through that specific market. So yep, it is depending on the work that you're actually doing. So translation website, um, interactive tools just for that market. Yes, or cover those costs. And the can export program will cover 75% of the cost and 25% is a contribution for the company. The can export application is now a two year program. You get up to $75,000 which covers two years of activities for that market. And um, it's a 60-day turnaround. When they first launched this program, it used to be a 25-day turnaround. But now they've uh, been promoting the program a lot more in the last year and a half. Uh, they're getting a lot more companies applying for it, and they're spreading the love a little bit more. Um, it's a 60-day turnaround, but I've seen companies get approved in 45 days as well. But I'd say average is 60 days in Ontario for sure. Anything else? No? Cool. All right. So debt versus equity. I mentioned our last fund is an equity fund that we do, but a quick education on debt versus equity is if you are trying to raise capital right now and you're like at concept stage or pre-revenue, and for example, if your company's worth a million dollars, you're typically looking to give away between 40 and 60% of your company in equity to raise, let's say, $500,000. That's a lot, of, a lot of things to give away. So I'm going to be having got the patience, so they'll sort of just take the money and get it. I will concentrate and see if you can get it through non-dilutive, various grants, assets, whatever it is, to grow your company, to get it to the MVP stage. At the MVP stage, most companies are giving away between 20 and 40% of their company uh, to get equity through the door of raised capital. Again, if it's not going to take a lot of money to get it to the product launch stage, right? try and explore non-dilutive, exhaust it as much as you can. When you get to the stage three and your valuation is almost, you know, gone up by six or seven or eight sometimes when you get that stage and you're ready to deploy into the market you're going to give away anywhere from five to twenty percent uh, of equity so and you keep control of your business a lot of companies fall at stage one so early that when they get to stage three and they start raising they they sort of lose complete control of their business so just think about that when you guys are raising it's not always the best scenario but I always say, think about this before you start doing that. So everyone that's got numbers are out there, they love looking at numbers. Here's a simple, simple chart. You know, if capital was 300,000 debt versus equity, at the end of it, yes, it'll cost you 18,000 in interest, for example. Uh, but you only end up giving away, cost of capital is only 6% versus 10%. And as you grow, that 10% is going to look a lot, lot larger. And uh, you're giving away a lot, lot more of the company in control. So that's just a quick example on debt versus equity. I'm not going to go into too much of a lesson, but 
if we come back, we can definitely run a workshop on all about equity and, and raising capital. So what makes OKR different? Well, first one is speed. Most young companies sort of need money yesterday. Um, so we can turn around an application, funding and financing, anyone the non-diluted within 10 business days, as long as everything's in place. So it's all about cash. Um, we do a hybrid approach where if you're looking to raise equity, I'll take a look, look under the hood and say, okay, is there any non-diluted we can get you first so you don't give away too much of your company? And let's just say you've got a $500,000 ask and we find 350 in non-diluted, but you really need to get to 500. We could probably top it up with another 150 to get you to your 500. That's the hybrid approach where we can do all assets uh, based, government funding based, as well as equity. So there's, there's a way of doing that. Uh, and then what makes the difference is we've been there, done that. Our, our, our slogan is to grow, scale and exit. And we've done that and we see things and we're not just a financing company, we're a strategic partner. Like if we can advise and push you in the right direction or find a synergetic partner for you and we see a fit, we'll do that. Um, we're, we're looking at long-term and long runs uh, of, of what we're doing. Many of our clients that have been borrowing off us for the last two, three years, and now ready for equity because they've got to that stage and we're actually just investing in them. So that so, so that's what sort of makes us a bit different uh, from anyone that else that does what we do. Industries we work with is everyone. Uh, we're not driven to a certain industry, uh, whether it's for investment or for um, for financing. If you qualify for a program or you have a an asset that we can leverage for you guys to get cash to the door, we'll do it. It doesn't matter who you're in. But, um, we don't just work with Canadian companies. We do have international clients as well, but our primary focus is Canada. Uh, that's where we're looking at deploying 150 um, over the next uh, 12 to 14 months. Uh, and so that's where the money's going. A couple of testimonials. Uh, both these companies are in Ontario, uh, coincidentally. Uh, Tina Bax, uh, CEO of CultureWorks. So that's one of the companies that was using the uh, digital media tax credit. It was taking about 18 months to get their money back and they leveraged that to sort of hire more people, get this project developed a lot quicker and deploy that into China with what they were doing. Um, Access Labs, uh, they borrowed money on two fronts. One was they actually landed a million dollar contract and needed money for inventory to put this together and, and meet the demand. So we were able to finance that for him. Uh, the second side was he actually got approved for SDTC. Uh, and so he needed some matching funds, large program, and we were able to leverage that to get him some more cash flow through the door. Uh, and go through that. So Access Labs and both CultureWorks are, are being repeat, repeat borrowers. CultureWorks has been a client of ours for about six years now, or five, just over five years now. Uh, and then Access Labs, they've been a repeat borrower a few times in the last year and a half. So, so it does work and it helps them work and, and grow the way they need to grow. The team, so Jason and Randy are two founders, both well-known and successful entrepreneurs, both won awards, um, two different personalities. We've got Jason, who's an engineer. He was one of the youngest engineers for um, building satellites when he came out to Canada from the UK. Randy was involved in politics, but he sold his first um, internet company 25 years ago. And, it, and after that, he became an investor in the Silicon Valley, went out there, learned the trade and brought everything out here. And he's now, he runs an angel forum called Valhalla. He's one of the founders of that and also heavily involved with OKR. Douglas, uh, corporate finance guy, he's the guy that does all our due diligence, all the applications, uh, the legals. That's what his team does. Um, he loves reading shred reports when we do shred financing, learning about new technology. And then Bill, being a CFO, worked with Jason for over 15 years on various different projects, from startups to large enterprises. And Wes is probably one of our most important um, members of the executive team. Is His background is for 35 years, he managed a portfolio for $45 billion dollars. Uh, in investment banking for one of the largest banks. Um, and he comes in and based on the asset-based deals, he brings his creativity because we're not a bank at the end of the day. So when we do our asset-based lending, uh, we can be creative uh, with different solutions and where sort of spares that. And then there's myself. So this is our executive management team. And, and we've got 24 people in the company now. Uh, and we're, we're steering the ship here from the six of us over here. So some, a few of our key partners there, we're all over the place. There's probably about 80 odd partners, if not more currently that we're working with. These are just a few that I mentioned uh, that are up there. So again, what do we do? We do asset secured loans, equity financing. The big one is government program financing for young companies to leverage uh, to fast track. Questions?
We have a few questions to circle back to in the chat. I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, we've been trying to find a good flow with the questions here today. Lots of good information. Um, so our first question uh, that I'm going back to is from Joe. Um, is, do you know of financing available for franchising your business? I do, but we don't do it. But CIBC has a program right now for franchises, a really attractive program. So contact your local CIBC um, account rep for commercial. They actually have a program for franchises. So my next question, how do OKR financials interest rates compare to banks and other lending institutions? So compared to banks, we're a lot more expensive. Um, and the reason we're expensive is because it's quick turnaround bridge loans. We're not looking to do long-term lending. Um, and the reason companies come to us is because banks can't do what we do. Um, so our rates will range anywhere from 1.4% to 1.9% a month. Um, on the shred, I believe we have a special rate for innovation growth, which is between 1.4 and 1.6% a month um, on the interest rate on that, on that sort of funding. Um, so yes, we are a little bit more expensive um, compared to BDC. Again, BDC rates can be really cheap. If they can lend you the money, I would recommend always talk to your banks and BDC first. And if they can't help, then come and see me. Um, so, that, so that's the honest answer. Um, if I compare us to some competitors, uh, we're all probably very similar on the shred financing. On the grants financing, there's not many companies out there that do what we do. Uh, and the re main reason is they don't really understand the programs, how to navigate them and how to tie them into terms and lock them in a security. So they may turn around and say, yeah, we'll do grants financing, but we need to lock you in for maybe personal guarantees or other things to sort of secure the lending. Um, so that's where we come in. Our next question, a couple of people are wondering about egg tech specifically, as that chart you showed for your services, uh, the piece of the pie for egg tech was small. Is there someone on your team um, with this expertise? So if you're talking about expertise for financing, yeah, that we do that, doesn't matter. Uh, we will do that. There's no, not particularly for ag tech, it's all industries. But if you're looking for someone to for um, the consulting to get government grants, then one of the consulting firms definitely um, Based in Ontario, I can tell you straight off the top of my head, I'd say Aiming Canada is probably one of the best in the ag, ag industry for funding. Um, they've, they, in the last three years, they've really killed that space with getting companies so much money in ag. So if you're looking for assistance with grants, I'd recommend Aiming Canada for ag space. If you're looking for financing, it's only a smaller piece because there hasn't been that many companies coming to us recently for funding on that space. It's always been the other industries that have been utilizing our services. So for ag space, definitely if you look for grants, I'll talk to AIM in Canada. Awesome, thanks. I believe I've circled back to all the questions we've received. If I have missed your question, I've got quite a few to me privately. So please um, just put that at the uh, top of my inbox again. Um, but we do have some time left still. So if you have any questions at all, please put them in the chat or raise your hand for me. I hope this has been useful to everyone. <laughs> So I am gonna just showcase uh, my colleague, Jerome. He is on the call today and he would be the face. Um, I believe he's got workshop ads and things like that. Um, take, take a list of his details, reach out to him. I mean, I'm always available as well. Um, and, uh, but for time zone differences and the main contact will be Jerome for Innovate Wealth uh, out there. Awesome. Uh, here we go. What would you recommend as a good starting point for people who um, are appreciative of all this information, but maybe a little overwhelmed? So a good starting point is, depending on what you're looking for, if it's for the shredding grants, um, talk to a consultant, navigate it, get a plan together. That's the biggest. If you're trying to do something internally, is create that internal business plan, sit down with the key people, say, okay, how are we going to grow this business? If you had, let's say, a million dollars, where would you spend it to grow the business? That gives you a plan and then go find the programs that fit into that fit into that need. And sometimes you'll find there's a program that might have 90% of what you guys are doing, there's a 10%, and tweak your project by 10% to fit the criteria so it's 100% and then go after that funding. Um, you, you might realize as you're going through this mini business plan, you might find flaws in what you're currently doing, so you can improve on that. But the biggest thing you might find is you might even pivot uh, your target market because of funding that's available. So you might have a software that might be for, let's just say, 
for the education industry. But all of a sudden you realize you can use that same platform for the cannabis industry and there's an ag grant for that. So you might say, okay, you know what? I'm going to go after that market because the ag grant will cover that funding. So I would say create a mini business plan internally as a good starting point to figure out how you're going to grow this business and then you know what you're sort of going to go after. Any more questions? Um, I'll just like to touch on one thing. I know that, that I know there's a lot of information I've given. Um, the recording's going to be available. Deck's available. And if you want to be specific or want to clarify a few things, I would encourage you to reach out to Jerome. Um, he'll definitely be able to navigate that. And, and if there's anything that he doesn't know, he'll reach out to me or he'll point you in the right direction, especially when it comes to consulting firms. Uh, we know nationally who's good at what and what's beneficial to each company. Yeah, Babak, I think that that's great. Thank you so much for coming. I think this has been such a uh, amazing uh, hour and a half with you or almost hour and a half. Um, a lot of information for people to digest and take away. Um, I also suggest if you would like to get in contact with either of them, reaching out to Jordan and I is a great first step because we can make those introductions on your behalf, especially if you're a client at IG, it's really great for us to be able to give them a little bit of context as well as to where you met them and, and, and uh, how, how you got introduced to them. So that would be great either or uh, would be fine. So thank you very much uh, everyone for joining today. Um, there's something that I totally forgot to do at the beginning of this session. You might be wondering who Jordan and I are. I didn't introduce either one of us or thank our sponsors which is totally unlike me. Usually I do it at the beginning, but Bavik, I was just so excited to hear what you were gonna say. So I would like to say thank you um, to our sponsors, which is ISU Corp, uh, Marexis, Reese Informatica, Invest in Guelph, BDO, and of course, OKR Financial. Um, we are super grateful for everything that you all do for us um, and, and the support you give us for all of these workshops and uh, wonderful programming that we do. So very, very happy to have you on board as a sponsor um, as well. Uh, I know that you have been watching uh, the ASL interpreters throughout this uh, presentation as well. So thank you very much to both of our presenters today. Um, SLEO uh, Canada is wonderful in the fact that they, they um, are sponsoring our Toolkit Tuesday series with ASL interpretation. So um, that we can reach a new community of business people. And I think that that's great. So thank you very much to SLEO uh, and to the rest of our sponsors and to all of you for joining. Jordan and I um, run the startup programming at Innovation Guelph, uh, as well as wear multiple other hats and very various different programs and events that we do uh, here at IG. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, we'll connect you to the right people. Um, but that's it for us. So unless you have any burning questions uh, that we should jump on right now, um, you will be receiving a copy of the slide deck and the video so you can kind of piece through and find what you need um, at your own uh, leisure uh, again. So just in case you didn't scribble things down quite fast enough, you will be receiving everything. Um, so wonderful. I would like to wish you all a very happy, sunny, beautiful day and uh, reach out if you have any questions. Uh, thank you again from OKR as well. Oh, wonderful, thank you so much.